I love Christmas. Christmas is my favorite time of year. The whole point of Christmas is that Jesus, you think about God had communion with man face to face with Adam and Eve, but sin broke that communion. And all of a sudden, God had to talk through prophets. He had to talk through dreams, visions. For 4,000 years, he had to communicate like that. And then all of a sudden, the birth of Jesus changed that. And all of a sudden, God could communicate with man again, face to face. I'd invite you all to stand as we sing our opening song, Joy to the World. Thank you, Dan, for that wonderful song. And also, thank you, Beverly. I really enjoy the, um, the music that you play this morning. Um, so could we bow our heads for prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this blessed Sabbath day. Lord, thank you for the um, Christmas season. Thank you for dying on the cross for us, Lord. Give us the opportunity for eternal life. And Lord, please be with us in our worship service today. Please be with Pastor Zach. Let, his, let your words speak through him, Lord and um, help us to get a blessing. And Lord, we just thank you for everything that you do for us. We love you and pray in your holy and blessed name. Amen. Excellent. So Tammy's going to have our children's story today. So if the little kids like to come up and pick up the baskets and go around, we'll collect a lamb's offering for today.
Good morning. Okay, so what are we going to be celebrating in a couple weeks? Christmas. Yay, Christmas. What do we do for Christmas generally? Right in? Thank you. We do. We celebrate Jesus' birth. What other things do we do during Christmas? We do. Do we? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes, we do. And family is very important. Do we pass out gifts? Yeah. <laughs> yes. So I want to share with you today that normally we give gifts away. We receive and we give gifts. But what's the greatest gift? Jesus' birth. Yes. And that's what we want to remember on Christmas is Jesus' birth, right? And also, when we're giving gifts and receiving gifts, it's nice to, how many like to give things to people? Does it feel, make you feel good? This thing is really, does it make you feel good to give gifts? It feels good to get, did you want to say something? Oh, okay. <laughs> it feels good to get gifts, but then when we give gifts to others, it feels really good, right? It, you see how happy they are? So Jesus is our most special gift that God gave to us, right? Did you know that you're a gift? Your life is a gift, just like Jesus' life to us is a gift. And when, when we're celebrating, we want to remember that it's not just about the getting in, in Christmas, but it's the giving, right? How many know John 3.16? Would you like to say it with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life, right? So that's the greatest gift of all. And your life is a gift. How many have brothers and sisters here? Wow, yeah, right? And you're a, you have a sister? You have a, I know you have a sister, yes. So when you were born, how great of a gift were you to your moms and dads and family? Very much so, right? Did you want to say something? That is right. And did you know that God did the very first, he thought of you, and he wanted to create you so he could have you in this world to be a gift to others. What can we do to be a gift to others? What can we do? What can we share with others, not as a gift, like a present, but to, to, to make others feel special? Yes. Uh-huh. That is a big gift. That's very nice. That's a good one. That's a good one. Yes? Yes, we can. That's, there are the simple things. Jesus is great. There's simple things that we can share to make people feel special because we're all special, right? We want to make them feel special. We can smile at them. We can say hello, have a great day. Jesus loves you. But yeah, sharing Jesus and the love that he has for us is, is a wonderful, that's the best gift we can give others, right? And I like the pay it forward. That's a good one. I've done that before. It makes you feel really good. <laughs> Because it's, it's happened to me, and it's, it's really nice. So Jesus thought of each one of you. You know what? I'm going to go down the line, and I want you guys to say your names, okay? Can you say his name? Philip. Anna. Say it louder. Anna. Anna. Emma. Leah. Jacob. Owen. Ciel. Aryden. What's your name? Bailey. Say Bailey. Mark Sutton. This is Bailey. Nice. Bye. Mm -hmm. What's your name? Aiden. Aiden? Aiden. Aiden. Beautiful. Auden. Okay. So each one of you are a gift. Each one of you was thought of by God and created by the king who we're celebrating here in a few weeks because he loves you and you're a special gift. So just remember that, okay, that when we celebrate Christmas, it's fun to get together with family and all the beautiful lights and the Christmas tree and the decorations and the yummy food and the gifts that we give. But just remember that you're the greatest gift, okay, each one of you. And we actually, I have a little gift I would like to give you. Auden, 
Uh, do you want to help me pass them out? Good. Here, I'm just going to actually leave it with the bubble wrap so it stays safe. Here, I'll give you two so you can do two at a time. So when you, when you get home, hang this special gift, and I want to read to you what it says on there. It says God's greatest gift because we know Jesus is God's greatest gift to us, right? So that's special for you, and that's your very own ornament that I want you to hang on your tree or wherever you want to hang it. So I hope you all have a beautiful and wonderful and special Christmas, okay? And remember that you are so very important and you are very, you are God's greatest gift to this world that we can share to other people, okay? All right, thank you. You can go back and sit down. Thank you, Tammy. That was nice of you to give the gifts to the kids so they can put it on their tree or where they want to put it. Um, now is our time for our offering. Uh, the offering today is for world budget, the annual sacrifice. And also, don't forget their local church budget and also um, year-end tax givings uh, for the uh, kids, whether they go to TCE or TAA. So could we bow our heads for prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for giving us the opportunity to work and to give back to you what is rightfully yours. Please use it according to your purpose, whether it's at TCE, TAA, the local church, our missions, or whatever you desire, Lord. Multiply it, and Lord, we just thank you for everything you do for us. We love you and pray in your holy and blessed name. Amen. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath to all of you. Um, like you said, children are a gift. Um, and I remember when I, I had my babies, oh, I wanted the whole world to know. And I think with Eli, there was no social media. I think it was like my space. I feel so old for saying this, but something like that. But I sent pictures to everybody in my family. I was just so excited. And I can't imagine God when he sent his son to be born uh, to save us. He sent a whole host of angels to announce his birth. And um, sadly, not everybody heard the news, uh, but the special ones did. And we are part of those special people. And we, we, we need to share the love of God of that beautiful and holy night. stars are brightly shining it is the night over dear Savior's birth 
Thank you, Ava. That is my favorite Christmas song. Um, I, Dina and I were discussing songs this week, and that was a song that I said, I wish I could do that during the praise songs, but there's two problems. One is not in the hymnal, and second, my voice just doesn't hit those notes. That was beautiful. Thank you. It was an amazing night, a glorious night, holy night, Jesus was finally here. God could finally communicate with man face to face. But nobody noticed. He didn't even have room to be born in a hotel. The hotels at that time were not single rooms. They were a big room and you couldn't, even if there was room, it's kind of rude to have the guests, you know, be right next to somebody giving birth. So... They have to be in the barn, and our Lord and our Savior is born around animals, and nobody noticed. 
And can you imagine how the angels felt? And they have to announce this. They have to show what just happened. For our first song, the angels have to proclaim, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Now, the shepherds were the ones that got to see the first message that Jesus was born. And can you imagine their excitement? They've, they've heard about a Messiah, the Messiah has been prophesied for so many years. They go and they rush to see this baby child. And they're warned on the way that, or before they go, that it's going to be a baby in a barn wrapped in swaddling clothes. They see it. They get excited. This child that has been promised, they can't keep this quiet. So they tell everybody in Bethlehem, they go to Jerusalem, and they tell everyone there. That's what we're asked to do. Tell everybody about this king that has been born. Go tell it on the mountain.
tell it on the mountain over the hills and everywhere go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is Now they told in Bethlehem, they told in Jerusalem, and you would think that people would get excited. But I hate to break your bubble or your, your imagination of what happened. You see these, these mangers all around town, and they've got these shepherds, and they've got these wise men. The wise men weren't there that night. They didn't come for another year or two. By then, Joseph and Mary were living in a house, and when they came to look for Jesus... Nobody knew anything about where he lived. The news was lost. And since people weren't celebrating God being with man, God brought other people from other countries. You see, Jesus isn't about just the Jews or just the Christians. Jesus is the Savior of the entire world. And see, we sing this song. Think about, now there wasn't maybe three kings. We don't know how many kings there was. We, they were the magi. But they brought three gifts. That's why they think three kings. And those three gifts are significant. They represent things about Jesus. So as we sing the songs, think about what those uh, gifts represented. We three kings. Oh. 
Good morning. Today's scripture is 2 Peter 3, 8 through 9, and I'm reading through the uh, New International Version. But do not forget this one thing, <clears throat> dear friends, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. So I guess it's that time of the year where you're officially legally allowed to listen and play Christian or Christmas music. Um, I personally don't have a Santa. I'm not a big music person um, myself. Um, however, I've heard that there's a great debate. I don't know. How many of you think you're allowed to play Christmas music before Thanksgiving? Okay, there's a few of you. After Thanksgiving, the majority rules. Um, <clears throat> Someone record it in the minutes. Um, <laughs> I know many people look forward to this time of the year. Um, I know many people wait for it. I've shared before in the past that growing up, um, Christmas was one of my favorite times of the year because that's when my grandpa would come and visit us. And my grandpa would make a great trip out of, his, uh, out of it from Michigan. Um, he would take like a two and a half day journey, just flooring it, trying to make it all the way to Arizona um, to hang out with me and my family. Um, of course, because it's warmer here than it is there. Um, during this time of the year, but I remember I would sit in class in like the second or third grade, and I wouldn't be able to pay attention like many of our students this time of the year. Amen, students? Amen. Um, <clears throat> and I remember I I was already struggled with school already growing up. I was like, I don't think I have ADD, but when I was a kid, for some reason, it looked like I did. And I would just tell everybody, I was like, my grandpa is coming. And they're like, so what? And I'm like, man, you guys are lame because you don't know him. If you knew him, you would like him. So then I would have to go and proceed to try to tell other people about him. I would, I would talk to the peers next to me. My grandpa is coming. Well, good for you, buddy. And it was the most exciting thing. My teachers would get upset with me because I had the incapability of completing something because because of this earnest expectation that was inside of me. I sometimes wonder, do we have that same earnest expectation with Jesus' second coming? We're so looking forward to seeing him. We so want to be with him that we can't help but go and tell it on the mountain so other people can hear about him. I think a big reason why it was a silent night when Jesus was born is not necessarily because... Um, because it wasn't a great event, I think it was part and partial because no one was really expecting this event. People had waited so long for this thing to take place that they grew tired of waiting for it. How many of you are willing to admit this morning that you are impatient? You are impatient. Yes, Tony, amen. Um, you are impatient. I am a very impatient person, and it's in my DNA. I don't know why. Um, I want to be on time to things. My mom raised me growing up. She was like, if you're not on time, you're late, Zachary. Or if you're not early, you're not on time. And if you're on time, you're late, um, which didn't make sense to me as a kid. Um, but I, I was just conditioned that way, so there's this impatience about me. I need to fix things. I need to work on things. I have this inability to just wait on things. And the promise of the Messiah was given so long ago in the book of Isaiah and many of these prophets who prophesied about him, who predicted him, who talked about him. But when his, when his coming finally came, no one was really expecting him because people had given up waiting on him. Had given up waiting on him. Um, <clears throat> you know, Recently, um, my, my grandpa, the one who I looked, always looked forward to seeing when I was growing up, he passed away. He actually passed away this year. And so um, I had the opportunity to go down there and kind of help with the memorial service and all that stuff. So I flew down to Michigan, and I was there with a bunch of my family, and uh, a family that I had never seen before. I had seen this, I had seen some of these, my cousins, I guess, in Michigan from my dad's side of the family when I was younger. But when I visited them when I was younger, they would bully me. And now was a chance for redemption. <sighs> now we're much older. And uh, no, I still wouldn't mess with them. They scare me. Uh, much bigger and just better at everything. Um, so I, we went down to, I went down to Michigan um, about the beginning of this year, may, or school year, maybe about September. And uh, as I showed up, 
it was just weird, really weird. Um, part and par- parcel because probably no one was expecting me. Um, I showed up. I didn't, it was one of those awkward situations with extended family where it's like you kind of know them but don't really know them. So it's like, how do you say hi to them? Do you hug them? Do you shake their hands? What do you do? Um, and I'm already an awkward person as it is, so it was more painful for me. So I go down, and I'm just kind of saying hi, and everyone's like staring at me like, who's this guy? I'm like, don't mind me. <laughs> I'm just kind of here. And uh, I'm kind of like, you know how it's been said, you know, every family has the black sheep of the family. It's awkward because, like, I've become, like, the white sheep of my family, if that means anything. So, like, everyone down in Michigan kind of knows me as, like, my dad brags about me to all his family. Like, my son's a pastor. He's doing great things. And he just loves the Lord. He is doing all sorts of things. And that part of my family in Michigan is not really into this Jesus Christian thing at all. So when I come, there's all these eyes that look on me like, ooh, pastor. I feel like I'm the black, black sheep of the family. And uh, when I was there— Um, I had the opportunity to share for his memorial service just a little bit, and it was interesting because for the very first time, I've never really talked about my grandpa to my family before, to really anybody before, and I got up and um, I shared, and I I shared a story about my, my grandpa that was super funny. So growing up, I sucked at everything athletically, and I am not athletic at all. It's unfortunate. Um, I think I have athleticness in me, but I have no coordination to do anything. For example, uh, one of our freshmen here at this academy um, during a one-on-one game with them um, beat me four times back-to-back in a game of basketball. Now, I kind of let him win, right? Um, But at the same time, I really didn't even let him win. Um, he just beat me every time. And I have no clue where I was going with that. Oh, yeah, my grandpa. Um, so, he, uh, so growing up, my dad, would try to, my dad would try to teach me how to ride a bike, and I hated it. I'm a really stubborn person, ask anybody. Super stubborn about the way things have to be. I'm very particular. And I, my dad would try to teach me how to ride my bike, but I would tell my dad, you're not teaching me right. To which my dad would be like, well, what is the right way to teach you? Um, I'm like, daddy, just get away. You don't know how to do this. I would try to help my, my, have my mom help me ride my bike, teach me how to ride my bike. Same thing. Mom, you really, you're not doing this the way I want to do this. So just back off, okay? Um, no, I wouldn't say that to my mom growing up. She'd beat me. Um, would never talk to her like that. And uh, so n- none of my family would ever teach me Uh, They gave up on teaching me how to ride a bike, but then I would be annoying because I would complain to them about how I'm so bored because I don't know how to ride a bike. So it was this existential crisis that I had about in the third grade um, about bikes. So waiting upon my grandpa, when he finally showed up, I was like, dude, my grandpa's so smart. He's so wise. He knows everything. He's older than me. Maybe he, he can teach me how to ride a bike. So my grandpa and I went into my backyard of this desert landscape that had absolutely nothing in it, um, just weeds and rocks and dirts, uh, dirts, dirt. And we were back there, and so my grandpa helped me get on my bike, and for a while, he was just, I had this expectation, this hope, almost as, I don't know if it was a placebo effect, but this hope that once I get on my bike, my grandpa is gonna, I, it's just gonna work. I know it's gonna work. So I got on my bike, my grandpa was helping me, and then he's like, all right, Zachary, I'm gonna start letting go of you, but I'm gonna be right here with you. And it was one of those things where he started letting go of me, and I was riding. And I was like, Grandpa, I'm riding. It's working. And he's like, good. I'm like, how do I stop? He's like, you don't, you just keep going. And I was like, I, I don't wanna fall. Then he's like, then you gotta keep pedaling. So I'm like in the backyard. I'm like, what do I do? I've never turned before. And so like here I am turning and eventually like I crash and fall. My grandpa's laughing. It's like you mean person, go back uh, where you came from. And um, I crashed and my knee got scraped up. Now, I never got beat up this bad when I was a kid. For those of you who don't like graphic imagery, close your ears. Uh, but I look at my knee, and like, this is probably an exaggeration. I, like, I for sure deserve stitches. Like, you can still see the scar, like, on my knee. It's a big scar on my knee. Um, it was just like, 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 my knee was, like, decapitated. Like, it was just open for everything to see. And I've never seen, like, white flesh before. And I got freaked out, and I was like, 
flesh is supposed to be red, not white. And I was just started crying. I was like, Grandpa, that's my bone. I can see my knee. It, it wasn't my bone at all. So my grandpa, like, took me inside, um, tried to dress it, tried to wipe it off. And I was like, oh, man, like, this sucks. But my grandpa always had a phrase growing up that he repeated to everybody, which was, it could be worse. It could be worse. Grandpa, school sucks. Eh, it's all right. It could be worse. Grandpa, like, my dad's mad at me. Eh, it could be worse. Um, so, like, here I am with my banged up knee, and there's, like, blood running down my leg. And I'm like, Grandpa, it hurts. And he's like, it could be worse. <laughs> and so he kind of, like, cleaned it out and uh, took care of me, and I never rode a bike since then. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, I've been, I, I, I kind of like bikes now. So, um, but this eager expectation of being able to see my grandpa because I know he'd be able to do something for me. I know he would be there to help me. I knew he loved me. I enjoyed waiting for him because I knew the results of when I finally was with him. It was way outweighed the process of trying to be patient for him. I've been reading a little bit, and you can join me in the book of uh, 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 10. And I'm going to kind of speedily go through 1 Samuel. Okay, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 10. There's two characters in, uh, in the book of Samuel that I really uh, relate to um, with my impatience, and it's Saul. Um, Saul was this guy who didn't really have the best reputation around. Um, he didn't have a bad one. He just didn't really have one. He was just kind of like, meh. He was the guy you grew up with in school that there was really nothing, I don't know, there was nothing amazing about him. Um, but God chose him. And in 1 Samuel chapter 10, Verse 8, before God elects him as king, or establishes him as king, he has him, um, he has him to wait. Verse 8, he tells Saul, you shall go down before me to Gilgal, and surely I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you what it is you are to do. Before Saul even begins his ministry, God has him learn the process and the discipline of waiting. I don't think we appreciate patience and waiting like we used to. We have everything at our demand when we want it. We can look it up. If we have, I tell my students all the time, you don't even need me anymore. You can just Google everything. What use am I to you? One of my pet peeves, my students, anytime I give them a Bible assignment, give, I bought them Bibles, beautiful blue Bibles. They'll be like, Pastor Zach, can we use our phone for this Bible assignment? No, you have your Bibles. Um... This process of waiting, I've been listening to this book um, called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by this guy named John Mark Comer. Not a Seventh-day Adventist, Christian. Um, um, he's a cultural influencer in the Christian and the larger um, non-denominational circle. And he identifies our culture's obsession with not waiting, no patience, and constant hurry. He says that the way our brains have been rewired, they've been reprogrammed by our phones, our devices, it's, it's mind-blowing. He says like a goldfish, a goldfish has a longer attention span than a newer generation that's arising. They require more stimulation, more entertaining, because the way our devices are now reprogramming our thinking. We have an inability to appreciate waiting for something. But it's not just us. Saul had it too. They had it back then. It's not just, it's in our natures. At the tree, instead of waiting on the Lord, we ate from it and then said sorry later and now experience the consequences of it. We have an inability sometimes to wait for things. And so to begin Saul, uh, Saul's ministry, God has him um, begin the process of learning of what it means to wait on him. Turn to 1 Samuel 13. Flip a couple chapters over. There's this other seven-day waiting thing that I find interesting. 1 Samuel 13, looking at uh, verse 8. 
Um, We'll read these verses. It says, Then Saul waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul said, Bring a burnt offering and peace offerings here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Now it happened, as soon as he finished presenting the burnt offering, that Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him, that he might greet him. And Samuel said, What have you done? Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattered from me and that you did not come within the days you had given to me and that the Philistines had gathered together at Michmash, then I said, the Philistines will now come down to me at Gilgal. I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled to do this thing. Verse 13, Samuel says to him, Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. Your incapability of waiting for this amount of time removes the capacity for you to be able to enjoy God's blessings for an extended period of time. Verse 14, but know this, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man who is after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. His inability to wait on God to deliver what he promised him kept him from experiencing all that God had laid out for him. Uh, there was this movie that came out in 2014. Um, I'm not a huge movie watcher. I don't really watch uh, too many movies. Um, but there was this movie that came out in 2014. I think I watched it on a plane ride back from a mission trip. It was one of those like 14, 12-hour flights that are really boring and annoying. And so I put on one of the movies. And the movie was called The Imitation Game. And it's a movie based upon the life of Alan Turing, the guy who basically invented the computer. And during World War II, the movie goes on to, pr- to explain how Alan Turing was coming up with this machine called the Enigma. And what it was supposed to do is decipher German code faster than people could do. So we had people on the other lines that were able to intercept German messaging uh, to kind of help stop the, the World War II and what the Nazis were doing. However, our people could not work faster to decode the codes, fa- to learn the codes and decode them fast enough. So he thought of inventing this machine that could not only learn the different codes, but also, I guess, deconstruct it faster. And so the way it goes is, what's super fascinating, is people's, the government's inability to wait on him to finish this machine. No one had the patience for him to be able to complete this great thing. They got upset with him. They tried to fire him. They pulled financial support from him because they were tired of waiting on him. So many times they begin to doubt him. They actually, at one point, the world praised him as one of the greatest mathematicians or engineers to ever live. They thought he was a genius. But because of how long it took for him to complete this thing, they begin to doubt him. They questioned his character. And they begin to doubt that he was actually really doing something that would help him. Their inability to wait on him caused them to begin to question him. Well, finally, when he completed, he was able to infiltrate German, um, German um, I guess, information um, faster than anybody could. And that's what we attribute, a big part of that we attribute to um, our success um, in World, 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 War World II. Um, get a little tongue twisted there. But... He had the capacity to do it. It just took time for him to perfect it. Uh, One thing that's been super interesting to me that I've been trying to fill my time with, uh, Dean Mark talked about this, I think a couple Sabbaths ago, just like what we fill our minds with. And it's very easy for me when I go on a break or a home leave or anything, just to watch anything, to do anything. So I was like, what could I fill my mind with that'll be beneficial to me, okay? Uh, So I started listening to podcasts, guys. If you don't listen to podcasts, do it. It has changed my life. I've been texting everybody, listen to this podcast, listen to this podcast. It's amazing. So there's this guy named Malcolm Gladwell, and I've been listening to one of his podcasts called Revisionist History. And in there, he identifies in culture signs of genius. How in culture, 
we don't have necessarily an appreciation for genius until that genius has already been displayed. And after the fact of the matter, when we realize it, then we have more of an appreciation for it. Like people like Picasso and these types of artists and things like that. Maybe they weren't appreciated in the moment, but after some time, we appreciate it later. That hindsight kind of gives us perspective. There was someone who learned to appreciate what it meant to wait. Um, this was David. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 5. 2 Samuel chapter 5. The Bible says that God anointed David to be king over Israel while Saul was still reigning. Multiple times, David could have taken the throne for himself. He could have killed Saul multiple times and took it for himself, but he waited. He would not touch him. He waited on it. And even though David was ready to assume the throne, he waited 15 years, 15 years in order to get the throne. Why? Because he wanted to wait for it. So the Bible says this in 2 Samuel chapter 5, when they elect him to be a leader. Verse 3. Therefore, all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron. And King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David as king over Israel. At this time, David was 30 years old. He waited 15 years for this, which means 15 years before that, he was already ready for it, but he waited on it. When he began to reign, he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all of Israel and Judah. If you look in history, David's rule was seen as the golden age of Israel's history. He ruled 40 years. And what is more fascinating to me is Saul also, according to the Bible, ruled 40 years. But their reigns were completely different. One was occupied with the enemy around them. No rest, no growth. Saul distracted because he can't defeat the Philistines. He's tired of waiting on God to overcome him, so he begins to chase David. He gets jealous of him and wants to kill him. But David, in the process of waiting for him, learning what it means to wait on him, enters into a reign in Israel's history when other people can now enjoy what it means to have rest from the surrounding enemies. David learned to wait on him, and as a result of waiting in him and resting in God, other people learn to wait on him and experience the rest that comes with the process of just following him, just waiting on him. David wasn't in a rush to do anything. I thought to myself, who's one person in my life that I know is just patient, who waits, who works, who is simple, who doesn't complicate anything, but who is simple in the way they do everything? The first person that came to my mind, this is really interesting, is Mr. Bob Thacker. Mr. Bob Thacker. Recently, um, Bob has become my wood supplier, okay? I call him, he's my personal dealer, he's my wood dealer. Um, He's got some good stuff. Um, It burns nice. Every time I call Mr. Bob Thacker, he always has time for me. He says, sir, Zach, you need some wood. When do you need it by? And he lays it out for me. And I thought to myself, man, when I see this guy around Thunderbird Academy, he works so patiently. I see him out there mowing the grass. I see him working on things. He lives so simply. It's almost like nothing bothers him. He's just enjoying Like life, there's no hurry to necessarily rush to something. It's this beautiful process of waiting and resting. Uh, One of the verses that come to my mind um, here in closing is Isaiah. Isaiah 40, verse 31, where it says, um, And those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall shall walk and not grow weary. And run and not faint. Those who wait on him. Now, what's interesting is when you grow impatient, then what can you begin to do to make sure that in your impatient, you don't become impulsive and ruin something that you could have been expecting? I think David 
revealed it. God revealed it in David. The Bible says that he delighted himself in the Lord. He was a man after God's own heart. He constantly was after God, not what God could do for him. He didn't just go to God like Saul, what can I get from him? He waited on him. He delighted in him. He enjoyed what it simply meant to follow him, not to just be blessed on him. He understood the simple fact that if I delight myself in him, I'm in no rush to accomplish anything. If God has established me as king over Israel, that means he will make me king over Israel. I'm not in a hurry to begin something because he delights himself in God. The Bible says he's able to enjoy what it means to wait on God. Turn to Psalm, um, Psalm 37 verse 4. I thought this super fascinating. Psalm 37 verse 4. <clears throat> Psalm 37 verse 4. This is a Psalm of David. And I think David could say this um, because he experienced it. Psalm 37, looking at verses uh, 3 and 4. The Bible says that we are to trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land, feed on the faithfulness. Enjoy it. Verse 4, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Your blessing comes not from receiving something from him, but learning to delight in him. Enjoy the process of what it means to have a relationship with him, and it makes it that much easier to begin the, or be to begin, begin the process of what it means to wait on him. You don't have to rush anything. You get to enjoy one of the most important things, which is a relationship with God, to delight yourself in him, to enjoy what it means to be in right relationship with him. Um, in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, 11, it's all over. Um, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, plans not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. After the 70 years, when you call upon me, then I will come to you. I will hear you. I will bless you when you pray to me. What God said, I got to turn to it. Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 29. Um, what, the promise that God gives to Israel in captivity to Babylon is to enjoy waiting on him. Enjoy what it means to have... Um, Enjoy what it means to have that relationship uh, with him. <sighs> Jeremiah 29. I should have written this down somewhere. Um, somewhere in Jeremiah 29, he gives Israel the command to enjoy the land of Babylon. He says, their produce shall be your produce. Verse 5, Jeremiah 29. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat of them. Take wives, beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons. Give your daughters to husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. Seek peace, this peace of the city where I have caused you to be captives, and pray to the Lord for it. For it is in its peace you also will have peace. That means in captivity, in your waiting, you can enjoy this thing. You don't have to just earnestly hope for it. Right now, in this moment, it can be as though you've experienced it. When Jesus says, I come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly, that's not him saying, one day you will get it. He's saying, right now, you can abundantly have it. And the reason why you grow so tired waiting for it is because you have not put in process what it takes to experience it. When we wait on him, that does not mean inactivity. I looked it up in the Greek. It's a verb. It's a present active verb. It means you're, as you're waiting, you are doing something. David didn't just wait to become king. He began the process of doing things that would eventually prepare him when he was king. It was an active waiting. It was something different. Um, in closing, you can turn to 1 Peter, uh, or 2 Peter 3, 9. 2 Peter 3, 9. Um, this waiting thing recently has just fascinated me because I have the type of personality where I'm constantly going, wanting to do bigger and better things. But I think God assures me that the most important thing is that we enjoy the process of waiting. In Matthew 24, as Jesus is talking about last day events, he says that people in those days, if the master of the house would have known at what time the Son of Man was coming, he would have wished that he would have been ready. He would have wished that he was actively watching and waiting. Instead of not doing anything, he would have wished when he comes again, the Son of Man, that he would have been ready for him, that he would have prepared himself to receive him. So 2 Peter 
I think, kind of depicts the reason why we're, it's not that, it's like this waiting game. It's not just that we're waiting on him. Second Peter 3, verse 8, the Bible tells us that he's also waiting on us. Second Peter 3, 8 says, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some of you count slackness, but he is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Another word for long-suffering in the Greek that's similar is he's patiently waiting. What if we're not the ones just waiting on God? What if God is also the one who is waiting on us for us to come to him? for us to begin that process of what it means to delight ourselves in him so that way we can begin to receive in the process all that is ours as we earnestly and expectedly wait on him. Let us not be like those people in the first coming. Almost no one was there to greet him because people grew tired of expecting him. They grew tired of waiting for him because they missed out on the blessings that they had and the process of waiting for him. It's that time for family prayer. So before we, um, please come down if you'd like to uh, pray up front. Um, last time I was elder last month, I had brought before the church it was a different service. We had to kind of move things around, and I asked people, you know, request uh, to pray and also blessings. And so um, the last time I was doing the family prayer last month, I brought before the church um, my aunt, Irene Hebert, and I told how dismal the situation was and asked everyone to pray for her. And I just wanted to give you an update, and this is on Facebook from December 5, so this is actually not even as recent as now, but something I wanted to point out to you because uh, it's amazing how God works. Um, if those of you that were here remember, I was telling you it was, it was she has metastatic cancer. She's in her mid-50s. Uh, it was just like her whole world fell apart one morning when she was having back pain and went and got an MRI. But God worked in advance about what she was going to face. Um, Michael, my uncle, says there's this Dr. Gully who's an oncologist with the NIH in Maryland, and they were the ones who developed this drug. And by the way, she's the 5% that can take this pill for this cancer, and it is actually working. Um, and, and she was put in place, uh, connected with this doctor through this Chung who they, with the church in Tennessee, years before they moved there, they made a connection with this Dr. Chung, and this Dr. Gully was part of that. And so this whole thing that happened for her to get this drug that she's now on and she's doing better happened way before she even knew she had cancer, years before. So I just want to bring to you that we need to bring our request before God. We need to claim the healing power that he gives us. I know I had said, you know, we have a healing God, and he did miracles back then. I see this happening as a miracle. He has this on Facebook. There's family, uh, our family, my mom's side that are not Adventists. They're not Christian. Um, they're seeing this on Facebook, guys, and it's a testimony. And I believe she's going to be healed. And um, I know there's other people that talked that day about cancer in the family, um, drug addiction in the family, different things. So I just encourage you to come forward pray um, with me this morning, and let's bring our request, and let's come back and tell what he has done. Not keep it to ourselves, but tell the miracles that he has done. I think that is, there's power in that. So at this time, if, if anyone wants to join me up front, we'll have prayer at this time. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for your healing power. I also want to thank Zach, Dr. Um, Pastor Zach, for bringing before us this sermon today about waiting. I know I'm a very impatient person, Lord, and I know that this last year you've brought some things to our, pers our family, personal things, that have been very huge trials that you've had us wait on. But in the end, Lord, we've grown stronger with waiting, and uh, it has developed a relationship with you. 
So, Lord, we continue to wait for your soon coming, and in that process, we also gain that relationship with you day by day with communion with you, Lord, getting to know you better, knowing that you're having us wait because there's a purpose behind it, Lord, just like you provided healing for Rini way before she needed it, Lord. Before we call, you will answer us. Lord, I, I pray for those that have come before um, here to pray with us uh, up front. I pray for their needs, and I pray for um, some families that are not here. I pray for the Katie family. Um, I pray for Irene to continue to have healing, and um, I pray for you to bring the right pastor to our church, Father God. Um, I thank you for this congregation. I thank you for this church family, and I thank you for the love, the long-suffering you have for us, Father God. I just praise you for that love that you have for us, that long-suffering love, and I just pray that you would give us all patience where we don't have it that we can become better waiters on you, Lord, and in the process develop that better relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Zach. Um, Great message of patience. Uh, God said, be still and know that I am God, and if we're not still, well, how do we know? I had a friend that died a few years ago, 97 years old, and her whole life she looked forward to, she thought she would see Jesus come. The people in Jesus' time didn't see his coming. They didn't, they didn't notice. We have a lot more testimony than they did. So thanks for the reminder that we need to be still and listen to the messages that we've had. So I'd invite you all to stand as we sing our closing hymn. We have heard those messages. Angels, we have heard on high.
angels praise above. Mary Joseph, lift your aid while we raise our hearts in love. Gloria in excelsis day. pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this blessed Sabbath, the opportunity to be able to worship you, Father. And I pray that through this Christmas season, we can be reminded of the blessing that we have in the waiting, Lord. Help us to realize what you have in store for us, um, Father, as you also wait upon us, Lord. And at this time, I pray that we can take action in our relationship with you, to learn what it means to pursue you, to do what we can to grow closer to you, because when you come again, everyone would have wished that they had that opportunity once again to be in right relationship with you because there's a blessing in knowing you. We pray this in your name. Amen.